Okay, good morning, everyone. My name is Sabrina Kofer, and on behalf of CHOICE and ACRL, I'd like to welcome you to today's program, Research Integrity and AI, Navigating Challenges and Leveraging Potential, which is sponsored by Springer Nature. Uh, this session is one in a series of sponsored webinars from CHOICE and ACRL that addresses new ideas and developments of interest to the academic library community. Uh, now I'll just put a couple links in the chat for where you can register for upcoming webinars or watch uh, previous webinar recordings. Also, if you're interested in library technology, LibTech Insights or LTI is a content vertical from choice that examines the day-to-day -day impact of library and education technology on academic librarians, faculty, researchers, administrators, and students. Uh, the channel provides practical guidance on technology trends and products as they relate to productivity, accessibility, discovery, operations, and content management. Uh, you can find out more about LTI and read the blog via the links I will now put in the chat. Okay, now before we get started, I'd like to point out just a few features of the webinar software. All attendees who join the presentation are automatically muted and your cameras are off. So don't worry about generating any noise or feedback. We've got that taken care of for you. In the main area of the screen, you can follow along with the presentation materials. To adjust the size of the slides or video, you can use the divider in the middle of the screen to slide the sizes to your liking. Uh, we are using the Q&A feature today. Please use it to ask questions of our speaker or to share any comments. Uh, we'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation, so please do type your questions into the Q&A module as they occur to you. We do anticipate many questions, so if we don't get to yours, we apologize, uh, but we'll do our best to answer as many as we can at the end of the session. Uh, you can also use the upvote feature to highlight questions you like or would like to be addressed. Also, there is closed captioning available for today's session. To toggle the automated captions on or off, please use the CC button on the bottom right corner of your screen. Also, please note that we are recording today's program and everyone who registered should receive a follow-up email with a link to the archive version and where to access the slides. And with that, we are ready to get started. So I will hand it over, for, hand it over to our speaker for today, Chris Graff. Thanks so much, Sabrina. Um, and thank you all for being here. <clears throat> My name is Chris Graff. I am the Director of Research Integrity at the publishing company Springer Nature. And that's really where I'll be coming from for the presentation that I'll share in a few minutes about doing the right thing and about the sort of interesting hotspot created by artificial intelligence, AI, and the world of research integrity, which is my, my, my day job. But I also should share a few of my other responsibilities outside of spring in nature. One of those is I um, do some work with the STM Association, which is the, uh, I guess, the trade body for research publishers around the world. And we are collectively working on solutions in the research integrity space between publishing companies that would otherwise normally compete. We think that um, research integrity problems are best addressed together, and there's a very active collaboration there, which is wonderful. Also, I am a member of the UK Committee on Research Integrity, which is, sits underneath, or is at least hosted by, the UK funding body called the UKRI that distributes through the research councils all of the research, public research funding money that is used within the United Kingdom. Um, and that committee is a new committee and I'm very proud to sit on it. It's doing good work. In fact, in July, it will publish its second annual statement about research integrity. And so if you're into that sort of thing, then uh, check it out in July. It will also have a chapter on artificial intelligence. And the last sort of voluntary role that I will uh, share with you that I, so that you know who I am and where I'm coming from, is that I'm a member of the program committee for the, the actual quite quite fabulous World Conferences on Research Integrity. And I say this right now because uh, in Athens in about two weeks is the eighth World Conference on Research Integrity. If you're not already going, then you're probably too late to book, but some of it will be broadcast online. And if you're into that sort of thing, then, then join in the fun. <clears throat> 
so onwards with the presentation after a little bit there about me. Like I said, it's a great pleasure to be there here. The, the, the rest of the presentation I'm going to divide into four sections. I'll start with a little intro to Springer Nature so you know where we're coming from as a publisher. And then I'll uh, zoom in on the world of researchers and research integrity for a little bit of context. I think it's really important to start with the world of researchers when we're talking about research and research publishing. After that, of course, I'll move on to talk about publishers and publishers' responses to research integrity, uh, including reference to AI, AI solutions, before reflecting in my closing thoughts on, on how collaboration um, is really important if we're to address challenges to research integrity. And I don't just mean collaboration between publishers, I mean broader collaborations between publishers uh, and other stakeholders, like the library community, like academic leadership, like funding leadership, like uh, uh, national authorities, as well as the research communities of researchers as well. So that's the contents. Let's get started by talking <clears throat> about Springer Nature a little bit to give you a bit of background. So Springer Nature is a, a leading global research publisher. And I'm very proud to work for Springer Nature. We have, I have around 9,400 colleagues spread around the world in 45 different countries. And in research publishing alone, Every year, uh, researchers, authors choose to submit more than 1.8 million of their articles to Springer Nature journals. In the end, after peer review and quality control, we publish about 420,000 articles a year. Um, and that work, that publication of research work for researchers and the communities they're part of, represents about 70%, in fact, 72% of everything we do at Springer Nature. The rest beyond research is in the education domain and in the health domain. But flipping back to think about research publishing, you've certainly heard of some of our uh, journals and our books, and also probably our magazines. Um, on the left-hand side, you've got a few of our journals, including bottom left, scientific reports, the journal scientific reports, which you've probably heard of. Flipping over to the right-hand side of the slide, you've got our magazines, and I'll bet you've heard of Scientific American. Uh, we published that. And in the middle, you've heard of our, the, 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 here are four of our books. Uh, we publish more research books than any other publisher, and we're really proud of the books program. But of course, it would be remiss of me not to mention the journal Nature, which is also on the left-hand side, because I'm sure you've heard of that journal too. I'm really proud of all of these publications. As a publisher, we're really committed to making the work that we publish for researchers more open, and in fact to transforming everything we do so that we are an open access organisation. Um, stat for you, by the end of this year, we will have 50% of our research content will be published open access, and that's a triumph. I won't call out much more on the slide apart from the, the point in the middle there that says number three, innovating to ensure equity in open access. And there are some really interesting conversations going on about equitable open access right now, and we're doing our best to ensure that um, actually equity continues and improves. I might also call out open science, the bottom box, because it's not just about publishing journals and the content in journals, open access. It's also about supporting researchers who choose open science practices or open research practices, choose perhaps to share their data or their code or their protocols, or indeed to share an early version of their article before peer review as a, as a preprint. And we're all about that transformation to open. Here's where the um, presentation changes gear and stops being about Springer nature and starts being about research integrity and artificial intelligence. And I'll begin by um, reflecting on, well, perhaps in quite an unusual way for you, 
on um, researchers who do the right thing when they publish retractions. And I do this because when we talk about research integrity, it's quite often the headlines that, that are attention grabbing, almost like clickbait. And um, they often uh, report on kind of breaches of research integrity or perhaps failures of research integrity, often uh, associated with the retraction of research articles from journals. But there are also uh, a, a whole load of researchers who do the right thing when they publish retractions. They do the right thing by identifying a problem that they've found in their own work and they work with the, their colleagues and with their, the journals that they published in to actually retract those articles. And I think it's worth celebrating that aspect of good research practice. And so I like to start my, my presentations by borrowing some stories from the blog called Retraction Watch, where Ivan Aransky and Adam Marcus and their colleagues report on researchers who have indeed done the right thing and retracted uh, retracted work that they found to be problematic. In fact, the very definition is on the slide. A doing the right thing article on Retraction Watch is when one of the involved parties does something admirable and we should applaud those actions. The three stories that I'll briefly reflect on span the sort of the, the, the research career from an early career researcher's story through a mid-career researcher's story through somebody at the very peak of their research career. First of those, is Susanna Stoll. Susanna was a grad student at University College in London, and she published some really impactful papers, papers that other researchers had taken and built on and, and indeed cited. And when she noticed an error in the code behind one of her papers, she realized that the paper wasn't reliable, and she uh, uh, discovered that error, the error and then retracted the paper by working with the journal. So Susanna, Susanna Stoll is one of our first kind of research heroes for taking those brave steps, steps and correcting the record. She's the early career researcher in our story as well. The second character in our story is Nicola Smith. She's a molecular pharmacologist in Australia. Um, and when she realized that her work was not reproducible she went to great lengths to understand why. In fact, some of the reagents that she'd used in her lab were not what she thought they were. Um, and then to great lengths to both uh, retract the papers and also to get through a university investigation into the, into the uh, problems with the work. And I think it was a tremendously challenging experience for her, one that she came through strongly and yes, also retracted the papers. And Nicola Smith did the right thing. And we should celebrate that. Uh, Nicola Smith is the mid-career researcher in our story. And the final uh, researcher who's, will, who's worked to retract their, uh, one of their papers that we'll celebrate is, is here. It's Francis Arnold, indeed a Nobel Prize winner, uh, working on enzymes and the evolution of enzymes. And one of the papers from her uh, many, um, she realized again when trying to replicate the work she realized that there was something wrong with it and she went back with her colleagues to the lab notebooks from when the work was done and identified that the um, there was missing information in those lab notebooks and uh, unable they were unable to find the data and again went through um, the challenges of retracting the article working with the journals concerned so francis arnold also did the right thing um, and and retracted the uh, uh, problematic research for good reasons. And we should celebrate that too. And of course, as a Nobel Prize winner, you may well, uh, like me, agree that she's at the very pinnacle of her career and we should applaud that. So those are some researchers who did the right thing, took steps to retract papers when they found that honest errors had caused has caused, caused problems that meant that, was the, that the work itself was not reliable. Let's now shift gear and talk about publishers, uh, people like me and our role in the ecosystem. And you've probably noticed a few things that I'll talk about first. This is a chart showing 
the growth rate in published output, so journal articles and perhaps book chapters and things like that, indexed in the database called Dimensions. And I've normalized the growth rate around the mean. And it shows the trend over the last about 10 years. And you can see that it's a steady increase in, in the growth rate. The next slide, as you might imagine, overlays the retractions, the growth rate in retractions, which of course happen after publication over that line. And you can see how the trends sort of, as you would expect, the, the lines mapped each other, the growth rate mapped each other. As you publish more articles, you're probably going to retract more articles until somewhere in about 2021, when uh, the growth rate of retractions changed radically. And that is publishers doing the right thing. As publishers retracting papers from largely, very largely from organizations called paper mills that we'll talk about a little bit in a little while. Um, yeah. And so those are some trends for you. I bet you've, um, one of the reasons you're attending this webinar is probably to, because you are interested in AI. Another might be though, that you're interested in research integrity. And these numbers will probably not be a surprise to you. What's on the slide is growth rates, but what isn't on the slide is the overall numbers though. I mean, the number of retractions, even though they've increased dramatically, is still less than 0.1%. So a tiny fraction of the articles published in any one year um, are retractions of other articles actually published in other years because there's always a lag. So it's very important to mention the, the sort of the scale of things here when you're showing lines that look uh, like this. So that's publishers doing the right thing by retracting articles after publication, but wouldn't it be better if the publishers hadn't published those articles in the first place? I'm sure you'll agree that, yeah, it would. So here's some thoughts about um, what's going on at Spring and Nature, the, the publishing company that I work for. A little slide about problem prevention, stopping problematic papers from being published and therefore never having to retract them. And what we do is we do our utmost to remove articles with integrity problems before they even get to peer review. Not wasting editors or peer reviewers time on these, but using the things that we can determine upfront and early uh, with our own colleagues and our own technology that I'll share more about in a minute. And the slide shows across the top a sort of very simplified flow from article submission through quality checks on then to peer review and an edited decision and then the preparation to publish that we do and then finally to publication. And I've called out uh, some numbers from the quality checks stage of that workflow from October 2023. So is that about six months ago? Something like that. So in October 2023, of all of the manuscripts that were submitted to Spring and Nature, so more than 100,000 manuscripts were submitted in October 2023, 11,000 of those manuscripts, we stopped at quality check stage before peer review because for one reason or another, they didn't meet S Spring and Nature quality check requirements. Of those 11,000 manuscripts, 2,300 were stopped because they had a variety of integrity problems. And the ways that we identified those integrity problems, I'll share some insights to in the next slides. They always involve pe people, but increasingly now we're using artificial intelligence and other types of technology to support those people in making uh, making good and rapid decisions. One of the first tools that I'll talk about today is indeed an artificial intelligence tool. It's called Geppetto. Uh, and what it does, well, it is a large language model or uses a large language model. And what Geppetto uses a large language model to do is to detect the use of a large language model in an article. Now, it doesn't detect well-used large language model, and I think it's legitimate uh, for researchers to use new technology, including AI and large language models, to help them to prepare legitimate work. What Geppetto does is it detects the inappropriate misuse 
of a large language model, which often leaves behind fingerprints that, like the most obvious of which, appear to be nonsense text. And that's what Geppetto detects. Nonsense text left behind by left behind by large language models being used inappropriately. I'll give you an example of that right now, and I'll explain where it comes from. So this is the title of an article. That article was generate, has subsequently been retracted, but was generated using a large language model. And if you've stared at the slide now for a little while and read the words, you can see the very obvious nonsense that that large language model has generated. Title reads, well, joins concepts together that should never be joined. Uh, earthquake activity, um, right? Okay, that's a legitimate subject or concept to put in an article title. I'm not quite sure what an embedded system is, and that could be legitimate. But then when you add the next section in, physical fitness detection of basketball, I've really got no idea. And it's obviously completely nonsense. So that article and its title is was generated by a poorly used large language model. And you might be horrified to have heard me say that this article was published and retracted, and yes, it was both published and retracted, and it should never have been published in the first place. Here's where we'll talk briefly about paper mills, because that's what paper mills do. First off, they sell services to authors who are working in systems where the incentives are not properly aligned with science values, scientific values, and where those incentives are indeed perverse. And what the paper mills do is they take advantage of that dynamic and they sell authorship positions to knowing authors, right? Those authors know they haven't conducted the research, um, but they sell positions on these papers to authors and they generate the papers sometimes completely, other times maybe they're genuine papers, they're just selling authorship positions. And then the paper mill takes another step. They pretend to be a legitimate researcher and they substitute a, somebody into the editorial process of the of a journal as a, an apparently legitimate researcher serving in an editorial role, usually a guest editor, and or as a peer reviewer. And once they've inserted that person or people into the process, that person or people, they're able to influence the publishing process to a degree that evades the other quality control steps that a publisher might put in place. And that's how paper mills operate. And this paper on the screen is a, an artifact of that operation, now thankfully retracted. And before I move on to talk about a different kind of AI technology, the, you know, I referred to the STM Association a, a few minutes ago in my introduction and the collaboration between publishers to, to basically address and hopefully shut down paper mills. Um, that's one of the pieces of collaboration that I'm most proud of, both at the STM Association and in the work that the STM Association and an organization called COPE, the Committee on Publication Ethics, the work that they're doing together to uh, to bring stakeholders together to address the problem of paper mills collectively. And it's really good stuff. The banner that they're collaborating under, if you're interested, is called United to Act. It's a campaign. And uh, if you're interested, go and look it up and then you can find out more about perhaps how you might join in. So that's one AI advance that we're using at Springer Nature, large language models to detect the inappropriate use of large language models in the generation of text. Here's another AI solution. And I'll line this up by talking about Western blots. Uh, you might be familiar with the story uh, in the headline on this slide about a university president resigning after an investigation last year. One of the reasons for the resignation were, was problems in the work that came out of that university president's lab, um, you know, some years ago, including problems in the Western blots presented in the one of the papers or more than one of the papers, 
and uh, on examination, it was found that those Western blots had been either duplicated and or reused, perhaps manipulated within a paper. And it was unclear whether those Western blots really represented the data or were, were not the data. So that, of course, can happen by mistake. It's um, quite complicated to manage image files like the ones on the screen and to make sure you know which one represents which part of which experiment and then to include them as panels in figures in a, in a multi-figure, multi-panel paper. It's a complex exercise and it's quite easy to get um, stuff mixed up. It's also quite possible to you know, edit the images or copy paste and use them inappropriately. So wouldn't it be good if publishers could, at the front door, when an article is submitted, or at least before publishing it, perhaps when the journal editor is inclined to accept the article, run the um, papers through some sort of automatic computer vision technology that could look for uh, duplicated or otherwise manipulated, uh, deliberately or otherwise, uh, Western blots and other images so that we could offer authors reassurance, uh, help the authors who've made mistakes to address those mistakes, and of course address or prevent papers that are the result of misconduct from being published. Wouldn't that be good? Well, that's what we're working on at Spring of Nature, and I'll share a little video about that right now. Actually, voiceover from my colleague Hirt, who's one of the developers working on it. Here we go. The analysis took about two to three minutes. And when it's complete, this document view is opened, uh, which shows the entire document, all pages. On the left, the detected issues are listed. Clicking the first issue will take us to the first page where the detected duplication is found, in this case, page seven. Both instances are on page seven. We can open the motor window by clicking the binoculars, which shows both instances side by side. In this motor window, we can change the view, if that makes comparison easier. For example, by flipping, we can zoom in and out show the image in the context of the document. And we can use filters to make the comparison easier. In this case, the emboss filter we can change the contrast, brightness, or invert the colors. In this case, it's a clear duplication of the same lane. So we'll flag this and we can add a personal note The status has now changed. We see that we have seven still to review, seven issues, whereas we have flagged one. Yeah, thank you, Hit. So now you've seen how we're using computer vision tool to uh, actually in development to um, identify problem images in papers and then prevent 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 that from being published. It's pretty cool stuff. Of course, that's our in-house tool at Spring of Nature. There are existing tools, presumably using AI, on the market, as it were, from all companies like Prefig and Image Twin and a, and a few others. So if you're into this sort of stuff, then you can get uh, technical solutions should you want them. So it's not all about finding problems uh, and either filtering out misconduct or helping authors to address their inadvertent mistakes. Sometimes it's about, from a publisher's point of view, helping uh, uh, everybody in the research system to get a little bit better. The net gain from that should be enormous. One of the things that we do at Springer Nature is to make available some of our knowledge so that research communities around the world can benefit from it. 
by publishing resources. And I'll share a couple of those quickly now before uh, concluding, and then we can move to Q&A. So here's the first of the resources. We launched this a year ago in my team, uh, my small team at Spring and Nature published this fabulous online course called Research Integrity and Introduction for Researchers. It's free, uh, it takes 45 minutes to do, it's self-paced and it's available right now online. I think that Sabrina's just posted a link to it in the chat. We launched that in April last year um, and then were kind of upstaged a bit by our good colleagues in the Nature Masterclasses team who a few months later launched another free course called Research Integrity and Publication Ethics uh, from the Nature, Nature Masterclasses team. It's much more extensive and the production values are, you know, quite a lot higher, um, but both courses are good. <laughs> and there's eight hours of learning here, broken into 10, minute, 10, 10 40 minute lessons with all sorts of good video and interviews. I mean, you know, what people who do this course can expect to learn is things like um, how to maintain image and data integrity and as well as availability, how to reuse material with appropriate permissions, how to properly cite your own work as a researcher and that of others, and how to avoid common authorship disputes as well as a wealth of other things. So I'd highly recommend that. Um, and these are two examples of things that Springer Nature does to help kind of share the things that we know and the rising tide lifts all boats i suppose and everybody around the world potentially could benefit from this right to wrap up and then we'll move on to q a which i'm sure you have um if i haven't said it already and i know i have um i'm a huge fan of collaboration not for the sake of collaboration itself but to address the problems that we all share and to make sure that well, actually, alignment's really important so that we are all heading in the right direction, if basically in serving research and science and the, science, the values that underpin that. So I, I get most excited by collaboration um, and I want to celebrate here how there are many organisations around the world, some of which I've already referred to, that are doing the right thing by doing it together by working on research integrity together. I get quite excited by publishing collaborations at the top of the slide. So I mentioned COPE, the Committee on Publication Ethics. That's a sort of publishing collaboration, many editors uh, and publishers collaborating on, I guess, standards for um, publishing ethics across journals and around the world with um, a new category of membership for institutional members as well, bringing together the worlds of the worlds of journal publishing and research integrity at uh, institutions. Underneath COPE, I referred to the STM, STM Association, the trade body for publishers. There's a couple of um, STM things listed there. And also the standards organization called NISO or NISO at the top, um, also thinking about publishing standards for retractions indeed. Those are all mostly publishing collaborations and they, they get me out of bed in the morning. Um, but what gets me really excited are the broader collaborations where stakeholders from across communities bring each other together to address shared problems. And I've listed some of those on the um, slide as well. I'll pick a couple out. Uh, a couple that I haven't mentioned. Um, there was a it published in the JAMA, um, JAMA network um, an article from about two years ago about enhancing partnerships between universities and publishers when it comes to research integrity. I contributed to that as a publisher. Many publishing colleagues also did, but a whole load of research integrity leaders from, uh, from, from universities in the United States also contributed and in fact led that work. And that was a brilliant collaboration and I stand by it. Um, you should look up the work, it's really good. Another collaboration on there is the United States National Academies of Sciences uh, Strategic Council. They're doing some really good stuff. In fact, they published a really powerful statement about trends in trust and, and research integrity in um, proceedings of the National Academies of Science only, I think it was in March, I was gonna say only last month, so two months ago. 
um, that I'd highly recommend you read. It really looks really brilliant. And again, is an example of a collaboration. There are stakeholders from across a broad range of groups contributing to that strategic council. Um, and the others I won't refer to. We can uh, maybe pick them up in the discussion afterwards. So I'll um, I'll wrap it up there and uh, say thank you very much for your attention and for listening. I hope that what I shared was interesting and valuable to you. And I really do look forward to discussing in, in the Q&A section right now. Thanks very much. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Chris. Uh, yeah, we have plenty of questions. So let's dive right in. Um, and I'll just encourage everyone, if you haven't submitted a question yet, feel free to do so. Can you also, And you can also make use of the upvote feature to uh, select questions that you would really like to get to. Okay, so we had two questions come in that are sort of related um, from Jane and Vicky, and I'll just sort of combine them. Uh, so Jane asks, is it significant that all three of the do the right thing examples are women researchers? And then Vicky sort of had a follow up to that. Interesting that you highlighted three women who yeah. retracted their work. What is the gender breakdown on retracted work? So um, that is really interesting, isn't it? And, you know, I'd thought about it and thought, I wonder why that is. But I haven't arrived at an answer. The reason I chose those stories, well, actually, I, I had a conversation with an email conversation with Ivan Aransky, who leads Retraction Watch, about it. And um, I, 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 we talked about some of the most compelling stories. And the reason that we alighted on these stories were because they're particularly compelling. You should read them. And because that they span the sort of the, the, the career stages. They really do show that. Wow, I mean, I, I was blown away when I realized that a Nobel Prize winner had retracted her work. I mean, that's somebody who's particularly secure in their, um, I assume, in their career, and for whom it isn't, a, or maybe it is a big risk, right? They've got a lot to lose. It's entirely different when you're somebody starting out at the beginning of your career and you choose to retract a piece of work. You know, that's really brave. And um and I really wanted to um, pull out the early career researchers story there. And then if you go and read the um, Nicola Smith's story, the middle, the middle story, I mean, the, the lengths that she went through personally and the, actually the pain, really, it was the hardest year of her life, it says in the article, to, to do the right thing were extraordinary. And I, um, those are the reasons we chose the stories. Perhaps there is some sort of gender um, orientation there. Uh, I should run the numbers, shouldn't I? I haven't done it. Um, I could speculate, but it's pretty unwise to speculate about things like this. Uh, I'll, I'll go as far as to say that articles that are retracted for the wrong reasons, I would hazard a guess that those are of a bias towards men. Um, there you go, speculation, not particularly helpful, but um, maybe I should go and do some analysis. I'd love to do that analysis, yeah. So thanks for the questions. Did I cover all of those questions there, Sabrina? I think that I might have got the main points in the, the, the two questions that you wrapped together. Yes, I think so, because Jane asked, is it significant? And then Vicky asked about the gender breakdown okay. on retracted work. So, okay, thank you. Um, our next top question, and this sort of variations of this question came in. Um, this is from Elizabeth. Uh, knowing that non-native speakers may use awkward turns of phrase, how does Springer Nature make sure that the AI program doesn't flag these people? Are there, article, are there articles outright denied or is there an opportunity for the researchers to respond to allegations? And they continue, I ask because I've seen so many examples of students who aren't native English speakers have their papers incorrectly flagged for AI content. Yeah, thank you. I really do appreciate that question. And you need to, well, I will share now with you some of the things that uh, explain how the Geppetto tool, the large language model tool that we use, how it works. And I'll reflect on some other things that we're trying to work out how to do 
that are about tortured phrases. Maybe you've heard of tortured phrases. I'll explain in a minute. So the um, the tool that we've made, it doesn't look at individual words. It looks at concepts, it looks at chunks of words and whether those chunks of words make sense when they're put together. It doesn't look at individual words and awkward turns of phrases. It looks at sort of the concepts that are going on. That's the first thing to say. That gives me uh, assurance that we're not um, biased against people who whose first language isn't English. That's the first thing. The second thing is that the threshold that we use, it's all about statistics, right? The statistical threshold we use is set extremely high. And it um, genuinely um, only picks out papers that contain total nonsense. Okay, it doesn't, I'll talk about tortured phrases in a minute. It doesn't detect tortured phrases, which are snippets, much smaller chunks. I'll get on to talking about that. So there's the threshold thing that gives me confidence. We've tested it and validated it extremely carefully. And the last thing is that it's not about the technology, it's about the person. The person employed at Springer Nature who checks what's going on and works out whether the computer has provided a useful, um, a, a useful insight that they can then act on. And these are qualified people working in the quality control process who are very well equipped to understand whether a readout from Geppetto is actionable or otherwise. So I feel pretty confident the way that we set up Geppetto is only targeting the nonsense papers from paper mills. If I told you some numbers, uh, we turned away after human ev uh, validation uh, less than 200 papers so far this year because of Geppetto. So it's not a it's not a thing that's having a huge impact and it's very carefully targeted. The next thing that I'll refer to is the concept of tortured phrases. Now, I think that's more aligned with what your question is about. Tortured phrases are thing, technical terms that have been essentially mistranslated or either inadvertently or deliberately. Some of them make you smile a little bit. Um, for example, if you saw the uh, term in a, science, a research paper, colossal information, you might be a bit confused about what it meant. Well, that is a tortured phrase version of the technical term big data. And somehow it's got mangled by translation software, either inadvertently or perhaps deliberately, and changed into the term from big data into colossal information. That's one that's quite funny. Another one is um, uh, bosom peril. That's a tortured phrase for breast cancer. Okay, it's less funny, isn't it? Um, but it's equally interesting to see these tortured phrases appear in research papers that um, have, have been through peer review and been published. And perhaps they're the artifact of a genuine researcher doing good things, or perhaps they're again, an artifact left behind by a paper mill trying to disguise what might be plagiarism or you know are using some form of generative ai to create the paper and they're the kind of terms that a researcher themselves they would know that big data should remain big data it's a technical term they would know that breast cancer should remain breast cancer again it's a technical term it's not um, complicated um, so I, I think we're interested in those signs. Geppetto, like I said, doesn't detect them, but, but tortured phrases themselves are more aligned with your question because they are harder to detect and it is harder to, um, rapidly jump to a, an actionable conclusion from finding one. There always needs to be consideration that the researcher themselves might whose first language might not be English, may have inadvertently created this artifact in the paper. The last thing I must say when we're talking about torture phrases is to give proper recognition to the basically the person who, uh, uh, I guess, identified this first 
and always leading the group of people who are thinking about these things. And that's a researcher in France called Guillaume Cabanac, who runs, uh, as well as his research work, he runs a website called the Problematic Paper Screener that lists a whole load of tortured phrases. And if you're interested, you can go and look it up. They're all there in the open. And uh, it makes for a fascinating read. So again, thank you for the question. I think you, I think Sabrina, that I covered most of the things in that question. Yeah. Yes, definitely. All right. Thank you. Great. And then before we get to the next question, I'm just going to launch a quick poll that everyone can fill out while we answer some more questions. Okay. Um. So next, there was. I just want to follow up with another question that was related to that um, from Sarah. Um, you pretty much covered uh, most of this, but Sarah asks, using AI detectors like Geppetto has been an issue for ESL authors and translated works. How can you ensure that the bias of native English speakers and writers doesn't prevent authors of other languages from submitting? So perhaps more like about... Go ahead. Um, <laughs> Uh, encouraging uh, non-native English speakers to submit or knowing that these yeah. tools won't impact them. Well, that's right. Um, and we haven't, so I think that my answer previously was quite a technical answer. I tried to describe the, how the tools are set up to avoid, the tool Geppetto is set up to avoid bias and that there were people involved in the process. Actually, that's always true of any AI tool at Springer Nature. Um, there are people involved with the process who are trained and alert to these to these concerns. And I think I answered that quite well from a technical point of view, but I think perhaps Sarah is asking about um, how we communicate that um, to, to, to people with English as a second language, how we communicate that they are going to get a, 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 an unbiased consideration for their work. And I, I think that's sort of I hope that's one of the values that we um, like telegraph to authors around the world. It's very true, actually, at least internally at Springer Nature, where we really are about being a home for all research, irrespective of where it where it comes from, as long as it's quality research, right? And um, and I hope that we're telegraphing that to people whose first language isn't English. Uh, quite well. It seems that if we get 1.8 million submissions a year, that's, that's quite a lot of the world's submissions and I um, feel like perhaps we're doing it, but I don't have the actual answers. I know that we're doing a lot of work in uh, our diversity, equity and inclusivity program to improve things. And certainly there's work to do, I mean, on gender, um, but also on the other dimensions of diversity, including, you know, national regional diversity and uh, cultural diversity but I know that we could get better so um, I guess work in progress is what I'd say as part of the answer to that question and thank you for asking it great thank you then we have a question um, that came in uh, does Geppetto detect fake bibliography because many LLMs generate make-believe bibli bibliography and this person adds, I'm a librarian. <laughs> uh -huh. Thank you. <laughs> Great uh, question. I love it. I really love it. Um, no, Geppetto does not look at the reference section. We're working on something else that looks at the reference section. And I have very high hopes for it. Um, I think references are in some ways more, I don't know if I use the word discreet, they're, they're, they're almost like a data, they are a data point, right? Whereas concepts and words and the choice of words and the way that you put them together in, you know, across a 3000 word article, that's not so much of a data point. There's an awful lot of human in there. <laughs> Wonderful things about that, of course, but references are less like that. There are a set of data points and they enable sort of the triangulation between data points to, uh, hopefully, to provide some very useful insights into whether the research itself is reliable. And machine learning and AI, I know, will be very helpful for that. So I, your question is spot on. Ge Geppetto doesn't do it. 
something else we're working on does do it. And on the market, there are other tools. There's one called, um, I'll say the word, but then I'll spell it. It's called Sight. It's spelled S-C-I-T-E. I believe it's Sight.ai. That, yeah, is is looking quite carefully at this space itself. Uh, so if you're interested, you might look that up. But yeah, good good call. References provide another handle to address paper mills, but also probably to give really good feedback to um, genuine researchers who, who for one reason or another, have have made an error in their bibliography. So I, I'm a, I've got high hopes for that that area. Okay, great. Uh, another, this is our next top question. I don't know if this can be answered, but we'll give it a shot. Um, is the full text of the retracted articles available for generative AI to generate responses with incorrect text for users, or the AI tools have the option to exclude the retracted articles? I, um, I think I get where this, uh, this question is coming from. I can see it now in the list. So hold on. So um, I think the question is asking about whether large language models themselves are constructed using data from published articles and whether that data includes uh, or excludes the articles that were retracted because they're unreliable, right? I think so. Great. And then the question is a very insightful question. So you, you, you garbage in, garbage out, right? For a large language model. If you've trained the large language model using terrible data, then it's not going to be a very useful large language model. Um, and so that's, one of the reasons why I am pretty conservative about recommending the use of large language models by researchers for what is a very technical, like a very technical job. Um, I really think that uh, researchers should be thinking very carefully before using an LLM to support them in their writing. Because the LLMs that are on the market really know where the data that they've been trained on has come from. Actually, maybe that's not true about open AI. But it hasn't been, hasn't largely hasn't come from uh, uh, the corpus of work, for example, published by Springer Nature, or even parts of that corpus, like the body of work published in nature journals. Um, and I and I think perhaps there's something in that. Perhaps there's an opportunity for publishers like Springer Nature or other high quality organizations to like basically create an AI model that assists researchers because it's designed and trained and built on the highest quality data that there is available. Uh, I speculate there, I don't know. I also think that it's quite important what happens in peer review. Like, I mean, this is this really worries me, actually. If, if we send out articles as a publisher to researchers, as peer reviewers, and we do it all the time, if they then put in these articles that, that literally belong to somebody else, there's somebody else, some other researcher's intellectual property and work, if they then put that into ChatGPT and ask ChatGPT to help in one way or another, then they're basically giving some other researcher's work to the owners of ChatGPT to train their model on, right? And that just isn't okay. I mean, I know that the peer reviewers will have done it with good intentions if they've done it, but it still doesn't make it okay. <laughs> and so I actually, there's an opportunity there for publishers too, is to take away the temptation of going to uh, ChatGPT or another large language model and and provide peer reviewers with a large language model that they can use to assist in their editing or peer reviewing, I mean. And that that um, avoids the, the intellectual property kind of leak from the authors of the research by the peer reviewers to the 
to 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 a large language model. So I, I feel that that's an opportunity too. Um, now the question talked about whether retractions are in the corpus that has trained uh, large language models. I, I, if if I were making a large language model from a publisher point of view, to serve scientists and researchers in the ways that we've just discussed, I'd definitely make sure it didn't include uh, retracted articles. But I just don't know what's gone into making the large language models that are more designed for general use. Um, I just don't know. And and I think that's an important... So that's why I think the question's important. Um, and that's why I know that um, you know academic leaders in the States and around the world are actually quite... Um, strict in their assertions about what what and how to use uh, large language models, particularly uh, in the research setting. And I think that's right until there's clarity about all of these questions. So thanks for the question. It was a good one. Great. OK, I think we have time for about one or two more. Um, before we get to that, there are some questions about um, Geppetto. So is there like just a link to Geppetto available um, yeah. that I can I'm sorry that the... I didn't make that more clear. It's not available. It's a tool that we developed for our own use in our own systems at Spring of Nature. It, 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 it isn't on the market in either free form or paid for form. And there's no intention to put it on the market in free for or paid for form. I know that there are other services available. <laughs> Um, there's one called GPT Zero. I don't know how good it is, but it's out there. And there are there are others that um, you know authenticate. Um, they uh, created in their plagiarism detection software a an AI detection module. And actually, I remember reading about that probably a year ago uh, around the controversy when they introduced that. Uh, perhaps one of the previous questions was reflecting on that kind of tool's use in the academic setting, where it had flagged problems, perhaps that weren't problems. Um, but uh, anyway, I, I, know I applaud, actually, I applaud Authenticate for, for trying it, and I'm sure that it's improved since it was launched, and maybe it's very effective now. Certainly, Authenticate is like like the go-to for uh, plagiarism checking in the in the publishing space anyway. And they do a lot of good work uh, with that. So um, yeah, to just sort of cut it back to the actual question, yeah, Geppetto is not available anywhere. Our, our Geppetto, I see another question about um, other tools called Geppetto in the AI space, which I don't know about, but our Geppetto is not um, available outside of Spring of Nature. Okay. Thank you. I think that answers a few questions in the Q&A. Um, okay, so I think time for one more. Since you were just talking about peer review, um, I think we can try this one. Um, this is from James. Chris, thank you for sharing. Your presentation makes me think about the problems inherent, question mark, inherent and question mark in anonymous volunteer peer review. Have responses to AI use considered addressing challenges of peer review? For example, having journal editors review peer reviewer content itself before using to make editorial decisions and forwarding it to submitting authors, compensating peer reviewers, holding peer reviewers accountable for the integrity of their work, et cetera. Wow. You wanted to ask that question with two minutes to go? Sorry, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, it's a really great question and I'm glad you asked it. Um, uh, how can I answer that? So what, one of the reasons I like the question is because it um, talks about a whole bunch of ways to use AI to assist the humans involved in the process. To, I imagine, for example, be a, I mean, I'm going to use the word co-pilot here, perhaps ill-advisedly, but be a co-pilot for peer reviewers to help guide them through the sections of the paper that really need their attention perhaps to help them structure their thoughts perhaps in other ways um perhaps it's a a way that ai could be used to help editors to be more uh efficient i mean simply in, a, in efficiency this could be a 
this could be a, a game like keeping on top of lists making sure that you're paying attention to the papers that are uh where where you can make the most difference in terms of speed for authors uh, as well as quality for authors i i, I think that the, wrapped up in the question is all sorts of uh, or all sorts of sub questions about the best places to focus the attention with AI and to give the best gain for actually I think for the researchers involved so for the presumably the authors themselves but perhaps that also means the peer reviewers and indeed often it means the editors yeah uh, not a very concise answer but a bloody great question thanks for thanks for asking it okay great thank you and yeah we're just about just about at time. So I'll say um, thank you so much to Chris for taking the time to speak with us today. And thank you to our attendees for your questions and your comments. Um, I'd like to remind our viewers that we did record today's program. So be on the lookout for a follow-up email from Choice and ACRL with a link to the recording and where to access the slides. Also, if you have a few minutes after the presentation to fill out a brief survey, we would really appreciate it. So thanks again to all of you out there for joining us. We hope you learned something new from the session and hope to see you again in the near future on another webinar. Thanks a lot.